Well, good afternoon and welcome to MedTech Crossroads. I'm Gene Peranak. Today is Friday, October 29th. We are nearly to November. It's kind of amazing. Episode 81 today of MedTech Crossroads. First of all, COVID Connect, we'll talk about the latest COVID news and also as we've been tracking for the last few weeks, what's going on with vaccines and transmission? Uh, we're trying to get to the bottom of that. After that, the start of a four week series based on a question that we got that we thought deserved some attention. And it's a very simple question and one that's of interest to many startups. How do I get a 510K? So we're gonna unpack that uh, really from square one over the next four weeks. After that time for Q&A and uh, any community events that you want to announce. But first of all, let's go to the COVID metrics and vaccine distribution from covid.cdc.gov. Actually, a little bit of heartening news here. Transmission rates are starting to drop in the South, Southern California, Southern Texas, Florida. They're actually starting to come down slowly. And you're seeing as a country, the transmission rates are coming up out of that valley. Now that doesn't mean that that's happening in Michigan or the Northern states at the moment, but well, we can hope. It's very encouraging. COVID hospital admissions. I have never seen so much green on this in months. That's really heartening down in Arkansas, Missouri, Alabama, Tennessee, uh, still the, the Rocky Mountain states, uh, kind of higher hospital admission rates, Ohio and Pennsylvania, lots of clusters of high admission rates. But have to say this is looking a lot less red than it was. So I think we can take some encouragement from that today. Vaccines uh, continue to be administered at about the rate they have been since July. That continues along a little bit of an uptick, in fact, since the low point in July, uh, hitting right under a million doses per day. Michigan, like we said, still in the red as far as transmission goes uh, deep in that valley, but there is some hope that that may turn in coming weeks. New cases may have found a peak. Uh, certainly the first indication we've seen of a peak um, anytime recently. And as far as testing goes, positivity rate holding, but the cases, uh, positive cases, uh, may be starting to drop just a little bit. So wow, we're just on a cusp here. This has surprised us before, but uh, we're hopeful, very hopeful based on what's happening down south. Deaths do continue to climb, of course, as we've known for years now. They lag uh, cases by a matter of weeks, and so we would expect that to continue to climb, albeit much slower than previously, which is a point to be thankful for. Hospitalizations, hospital admissions uh, in the state of Michigan showing the first downtick since they started climbing again in July. We'll see if that holds, but that would certainly be good news, having reached a level only half of the previous two peaks. Uh, so that would be also very encouraging. Um, and the percentage of Delta in the state of Michigan, also from CDC.gov, is now 99.2%. It is, it is basically 100%. Uh, currently, no other variants, um, uh, except for some small 0.8% of them. This is the graphic that CDC actually leads with. And for many of us, it was sort of a, why did you put that in CDC? We don't really understand. It's basically this. The darker that graph is, the less effect on transmission vaccination is having. The lighter that graph is, top left corner, those nice turquoise colors, the more effect on transmission vaccination is having. Sadly, it is a pretty dark picture uh, in terms of vaccination stopping transmission. Uh, in fact, we've been tracking for the last few weeks uh, the journal Nature. Uh, we reported two articles last week. This week, uh, in this whole question of vaccination and transmission. Now, remember, vaccination has been proven and uh, even more data coming out this uh, week from New York Times showing very clearly how vaccination reducing severity, reducing hospitalizations wonderful success. In terms of transmission, however, this from the Lancet this week, they, in fact, today, they are, have shown um, in their estimation that while vaccination reduces the risk of getting the Delta variant, 
uh, and accelerates viral clearance, which is really fascinating. It gets it out of your system more quickly. Nevertheless, peak viral load of a case is equivalent whether you're vaccinated or not. And so when you're in close contact with people, and they've put the focus on the family situation, uh, where folks are together, you really can't avoid it. That's what they're saying is where most of the infections are coming. Now that's, that's preliminary. I don't think we've ever heard that before. So I'd take that with a grain of salt, but they're suggesting that households are really where the majority of transmission is happening these days. Uh, including to fully vaccinated contacts because you're just spending so much time together. You're right on top of each other. Uh, so really, really interesting, uh, certainly not taking away from the efficacy of vaccines when it comes to reducing uh, the severity of the disease because you're exposing yourself to that spike protein. So, uh, but also um, sadly not giving us the hope that we'd had that the vaccines would just wipe out the transmission. Well, with that, that's the COVID news. I want to turn our attention to local happenings. Uh, the A2 Biosocial is back, thanks to Matthew Himes and a number of partners, including Mish Bio and Ann Arbor Spark, and I believe my lead consulting is on that list. The sponsor this, uh, this month is MIHQ on the west side of Ann Arbor, uh, housing many, many of our uh, local med tech and health tech startups. They will be outdoors at York in Ann Arbor from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, this uh, November 9th. And they've gone through this rain or shine. They were in a park um, and now they're back at York and they're going to be, uh, they got sponsors back. Great place. Uh, when this was pre-COVID, uh, um, we were at one where I believe 150 people showed up. This really has the promise of being a great place to meet the local community. So I hope that folks will go out and support the A2 Biosocial Tuesday, November 9th. Also wanna remind you about the $2,500 quarterly MedTech Crossroads pitch party. Um, we are still looking for participants for that. Startups that want a chance at $2,500. We'll write you a check for $2,500 if our judges say yes. Send those pitch decks to pitchparty at medtechcrossroads.org to be eligible for selection. And every startup gets 10 minutes at the end of a show. And near the end of each quarter, our judges, our illustrious judges, you see them there, Andy Rader, Dr. Nikki Kennedy, Jim Medsker, and Stacy Frankovich, will pick uh, one that they like more than the others and tip their hat towards that one. Uh, that doesn't mean that um, that's really the main point. The main point is to feed back on what's good, what's bad, what do they like, what do they not like, what's strong, what's weak in these pitches, and give us all new ideas to think about. So send those uh, pitches in, and we're looking forward to the next installment of the pitch party. Well, with that, we're going to get to our main uh, event today, which is this question. How do I get a 510K? And it's funny because over the course of the show, we've talked to so many guests, we've made so many FDA educational segments, and oftentimes we'll dive really deep into some topic and unpack it in ways that you probably haven't heard unpacked before. That's always exciting. But sometimes when you're diving deep, you can miss the obvious. And sometimes that question is phrased in terms of the value that it brings to a med tech company. And the question that so many want to know, early stage med tech companies, how do I get a 510k? You've heard this term, it's thrown around, it seems like the gateway to your market, it seems like the gateway through the FDA. How do I get that? So over the course of the next four weeks, starting today, we are going to start to answer that question. Today, Friday, October 29th, we're going to answer this question, how do I know if a 510k is right for me? Next week on Friday, November 5th, what goes into a 510K? And when I say that, I mean more from a statutory standpoint. What are the elements of a 510K? What has to be there? Less next week on how do you create them and more on what are they? The week after on Friday, November 12th, we'll be talking about how do I actually prepare and submit a 510K? That's kind of the meat on the bones. Okay, now you know what goes into the buckets, but how do you ever get that stuff? And finally, on Friday, November 19th, 
we will be talking about what happens after I file. Because a lot of times people think you're just gonna file and you're gonna get it. Well, it's the FDA's job to review that 510K, to come back with feedback, criticisms, comments, questions for you. And they do, they always do. And we'll talk about what those can be like, how to respond to them and what to expect. And before we go into today's topic, let's answer this basic question. What is a 510K? Sometimes called a pre-market notification. What is the thing? Well, here's what FDA says. A 510K is a pre-market submission. Let's unpack that for just a second. It means you're doing this before you sell your product. You can't go to market if a 510K is required without one. And it's a submission made to FDA, it means you have to send it to them. It's something you've got to send to them for their review before you can go to market. To demonstrate, well, what does it mean to demonstrate something? You can't just send it in and give your word. It's something that you have to provide what the FDA calls objective evidence for. To demonstrate that the device to be marketed is as safe and effective that is substantially equivalent to a legally marketed device. That word as is really important. If I ask you if a device is safe and effective, you could prove to me that it is in many different ways. You could do all sorts of clinical trials. You could create all sorts of forms of proof. Or you could compare it to a device that's already on the market, saying, well, if that device is already on the market and it's considered safe and effective, and ours is similar enough, then you should let us on the market. Historically, the idea is that this reduces the burden on companies of getting innovations to market because you don't have to prove from scratch that the device is absolutely safe and effective. You just have to prove that it's substantially equivalent to a legally marketed predicate device, that it's as safe and effective as that device that you're targeting. So with that in mind, today's question is, how do I know if a 510K is right for me and my company? And we're gonna talk about a number of things today. First of all, is my product actually a medical device? If it's not, a 510K doesn't apply, so we can just head right off in the other direction. To understand that, we'll have to start to understand what is the intended use of my product? Understanding that, we'll have to ask, when is a 510K required? Or maybe my product requires a PMA. Maybe my product is exempt from a 510K. Even if it's a medical device, I might not have to do a 510K. That brings us deep into the question of how do you classify your device? Because to get the answers to those questions, you have to understand product classification. If you understand your classification, you can find a predicate device you can consider your substantial equivalence to that device and understand which of the different types of 510Ks might be appropriate for you to file. We haven't even talked about what's in a 510K yet. This is just how you figure out, is it appropriate for me? Which type might I file? And what are some of the basics going in? So let's ask this question first. Is my product actually a medical device? Now, we've seen people ask, oh, I, I want to be regulated by FDA. Well, not necessarily. That's a heavy lift. And it really isn't your choice, and it's not really anybody else's choice. It has to do with this. Per Section 201H of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, a medical device is an instrument apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar or related article, that's a mouthful, including a component part or accessory. It's something, it's, it's, it's an object, it's a device, which either is recognized in these documents, the National Formulary or the United States Pharmacopeia. Did you know that medical devices, some medical devices are actually defined in the place that basically has drug recipes for many generic drugs. Yeah, some of, the, some of the medical devices are actually defined there, and that could be a medical device. But more commonly, a medical device is something that is intended for use 
in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in man or other animals. Look at that word right there, those two words, intended for. Something similar is going to pop up here in a second. Intended to affect the structure or function of the body and which does not achieve its primary intended purposes through chemical action and that doesn't do it through metabolization. What would that be? That'd probably be a drug. So you have this thing, this object, and it's used for the diagnosis of disease or treatment, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, or it's intended to affect the structure or function of the body, not by chemical means, not by metabolization. That's the FDA's definition of a medical device. There are other things your product might be other than a medical device. It might be a biologic. We're all very familiar that the, that the vaccines were cleared not under the Center for Devices and Radiological Health or even the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, but under CBER, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Your product could be a drug if it's metabolized. Your product could be a health and wellness device. That's something that gets a lot of exemption these days. The FDA sort of says, if you're playing over here, you can do that. Now, if your product is software, software can be a device. It's called SAMD, Software as a Medical Device. And it's subject to many of the same regulations, including 510K. But not every piece of software used for medical purposes is a medical device. So things like software intended for administrative support of a healthcare facility, that's not a medical device. Software intended for maintaining or encouraging a healthy lifestyle, not a medical device. Software intended to serve as electronic patient records. The waters can get murky here because oftentimes companies will try to build in treatment and diagnosis and other behaviors into those electronic patient records. But at their core, electronic patient records, FDA has said, are not medical devices. Software intended for transferring, storing, converting formats, displaying data and results, not a medical device. These things are not medical devices. And it's important to realize if you fall into one of these categories, you're not going to be subject to a 510K. It's worth talking about, it's worth researching, but know that there are these categories, uh, even among things like software, where you think, oh, SAMD, I'm a medical device. Not necessarily. So be cognizant of that. But you really can't answer that question until you understand the answer to this very important question. What is the intended use of my product? This drives everything else. So I want you to pause and remember these two words, intended use. Everything in your product development and regulatory effort somehow comes back to these two words. And around those two words, there's a lot of other words. This is probably the most, uh, the worst slide in this deck. September 1st this year, FDA actually updated the uh, definition and the description of intended use. Not much, really just made a small clarification. But reading the underlined portions here, intended use is the objective intent of the persons legally responsible for labeling of an article or their representatives. That means that your manufacturer isn't really responsible for defining the intended use. It's, it's you, the company that puts the device to market. Your consultants aren't the ones who are responsible for defining the intended use. It's you, the company that puts the device to market. And that intended use can be shown through expressions, through the design or composition of the article, by circumstances surrounding the distribution of the article, labeling claims, advertising matter, oral or written statements. If your sales agents make statements about the device and what it's good for, that becomes a part of your intended use. 
So if you are offering or using the device for a purpose that it's not cleared for, it's going to get you into trouble. But here's the FDA's clarification. The very fact that you know that doctors and clinicians are using the device for something other than its intended use doesn't mean that you are adulterating that or misbranding that. In fact, a firm would not be regarded as intending an unapproved new use based solely on that firm's knowledge that such a device was being prescribed or used by healthcare providers for such use. What pushes you over the line? What really makes an intended use an intended use? It's when your company, and specifically the part of the company that's responsible for marketing and putting that device out there to the world, when that part of your company makes claims about it. So if people are using it in different ways, FDA says that's not really the big concern. The big concern is when you start to advertise and talk about and label that device with something other than its cleared intended use. Indications for use is a term that you'll sometimes hear as well. It's really just a subset of intended use that describes when and how the product is used. So if you have a device that's good for cutting tissue and you happen to say that this one's particularly good for cutting a particular type of tissue in a particular situation, it would usually be that latter part that's the indications for use. So now we come to the question. When is a 510K required? Well, this is not a complete statement that you see on the screen. I want you to be aware of that. But let's start with this. We blanked out the portions that make this a little more complicated. So we could start with the simplest statement. Each person who wants to market in the US a class one, class two, or class three device intended for human use must submit a 510K to FDA. Now as read, that is a materially false statement because I've left out two parts of it. But if you start with that basic understanding that a 510K is how you're going to get your device to market, we can start to look at the exceptions. Each person who wants to market in the US a class one, two, or three device intended for human use for which a pre-market approval is not required must submit a 510K. Okay, so this shows us one place where a 510K may not be appropriate. If our device is subject to a class three pre-market authorization or a de novo um, finding, which we won't get into depth on today, you wouldn't be submitting a 510K, you'd be submitting a PMA or a de novo. So on that high side, it's important to realize that this is something that could require more scrutiny than a 510K. But there are also exemptions. And here's the last part of the statement unless the device is exempt from 510k requirements. So if you want to market a device in the US and you're not subject to PMA and you're not exempt from 510k, you have to submit a 510k. Hopefully breaking it down that way makes a little more sense. And FDA doesn't say, oh, this person always needs to do it because this is based not on so much who the person is as to what they're trying to do. They're trying to put a device on the market with specific claims. So this could be a domestic manufacturer introducing the device to the US market. This could be a specification developer who isn't doing the manufacturing themselves, but is still labeling that product, owning that product, and with a contract manufacturer, bringing that device to the US market. It could be a repacker or relabeler. Now, at default, repackers and relabelers don't need to submit 510Ks for the products that they repack and relabel. But if you make labeling changes that significantly affect the device and that change its intended use, you better believe that you're subject to 510K. One more word on this. This is why if a company comes to us and says, we want to get into some kind of a distribution agreement where we're making modifications to a device. Often our advice to them will be, hold up, that could put you as the device owner, it could put you in the place of having to own a new 510K around the device. Whereas if you just sell that device as a distributor or as a repacker and relabeler, 
it could be a very different situation. And finally, this could apply to a foreign manufacturer or exporter or U.S. representatives of foreign manufacturers or exporters introducing a device to the U.S. market. So all of these are the types of entities that you would expect to need a 510K if they're not otherwise under PMA or if they're not otherwise exempt from a 510K. So times that a 510K may not be required, let's review. If a PMA or de novo is required instead, or if there's an exemption to your 510K. We'll talk about those more in a minute. Also, if you're selling device components, you're a manufacturer and you're making device components and they get incorporated into someone else's medical device, you're not necessarily required to file a 510K because you're not selling the device to end consumers with marketing claims. Now, as a converse, many times manufacturers will advertise that they work in medical devices as though they owned a product from A to Z, but really they were just selling a component or working on a component. That's important to distinguish as you evaluate manufacturers. Shipping a device around for pre-market testing? Well, you'd think that's distribution and interstate commerce, except there's a carve out for that. With proper labeling, that doesn't require a 510K. Repacking and relabeling, like we said, doesn't require a 510K unless it goes too far. And import, if you're just importing and that foreign exporter holds a 510K, but you're just a distributor and importer, 510K probably not required. Well, <laughs> what about these other things? What about a PMA? What about a de novo? Maybe my device is 510K exempt. How do I know? How do I figure this out? Well, we can't go there directly. There's something else you need to understand. Introducing the concept of product classification. You've probably heard us talk about this on MedTech Crossroads before, but here's how it fits into the whole question of how do I get a 510K? The Food and Drug Administration has established 1,700 different generic types of devices. They've grouped them into these panels and they've given names to the panels. They've also then broken these down into three classes of devices, class one, class two, and class three in ascending risk. Class one requires the implementation of general controls. We can talk more about that later. And class one devices sometimes come with exemptions and sometimes they come without exemptions. Class two devices, have general controls and special controls applied to them. There's more that has to be done. And they can come with exemptions or without exemptions. The class three devices still require general controls, but they also require pre-market approval. So how do you find your product classification? How do you find your product code? How do you find out which class you are? How do you find out what do I have to do to get this product to the market? Well, there's a few ways to start doing this research. One is to go directly to the panels, the product uh, code panels, and just browse them. They are divvied up into 16 panels, but oftentimes which panel they're put into doesn't make a lot of sense to the average observer. So a better way is to search the classification database, the FDA classification database using keywords and other things to look and see which product classification might I fit into. Also, you can use pathsurveyor.com. It's a free service that Intubeing keeps out on the great web. And uh, it's a really uh, fun and easy way to do some of this research and get quickly to some of the back information. It's always a good idea to confirm your findings with someone skilled in the field and with FDA if needed. There are things like 513G submissions to the agency, which allow you to confirm your classification findings. So the question we're answering now is, how do I know if I'm subject to a 510K or a PMA, or maybe I'm exempt? Comes down to your classification, and you've got to do some research. Here are the panels running from anesthesiology to toxicology. Now, if you happen to know exactly where similar types of devices are placed, 
you can look those panels up and you can go right there and you can start to read about it. Barring that, FDA maintains this classification database where you can search with a number of keys here and you can start to find those medical device classifications that you can then research further. We're particularly fond of Path Surveyor, which is a tool that we created, a free service out there. It has been free and you can continue to use it for free. It is a single search bar where you can type in any keywords you may have about your device of interest. And it's going to come back with all sorts of fun stuff. It's going to come back with historic clearance times for 510Ks that are, that are similar. It's going to come back with recently approved devices in the same product code, which is really cool. And click on the K number and get to that company's 510K summary. It's going to come back with full submissions sometimes. These are uh, always nice when you come to them. But sometimes you can get a redacted foia full submission um, that FDA has uh, made available. And those are made available if they're uh, available directly through Pass Surveyor. So here's an example. Here's a thermal regulating system. Remember that whole concept of intended use? Well, what's the intended use of a thermal regulating system? It's an external system that, see that last sentence? It's used to regulate patient temperature. It consists of a device that's placed in contact with the patient and a temperature controller for the device. The only other thing it says is that it's a class two device that has performance standards. That's it. So what did that help? How did that tell me what I have to go through? Well, remember this principle that we established just a little while ago. Each person who wants to market in the US a class one, class two, or class three device intended for human use must submit a 510K to FDA, unless it's PMA or unless they're exemptions. I don't see any exemptions on here, and I don't see any indication that it's a class three PMA device. In fact, I see indication that it's a class two device. So it's a safe assumption that this device is eligible for 510K. Let's look at some examples of things that aren't eligible for 510K. So here we have an automated external defibrillator. And they give the definition of that, the identification of that, which is really a form of intended use of the device. But it's a class three. And they say right there, requires pre-market approval. Now you know that that's not something you're going to do through a 510K. There's also additional requirements below that, but because it's a class three, we're not going to go into those today. Here's another example. While electric wheelchairs require uh, 510Ks, here's an electric positioning chair. It's a class two device. But notice these key words. It is exempt from the pre-market notification procedure. That's great news, because if you recall, that's what a 510K is. So while you have a device that is class two here, it actually doesn't require a 510K. And you'll find many devices like this, that even though you'd think they'd require a 510K, they have been exempted from it. Other exemptions that you can find are exemptions from design controls of the quality system. You can find exemptions from the quality system ex itself, and you'll find those in these product code summaries, inside these regulation number summaries. Once again, at the top, we have the intended use of the device under the identification uh, section. It shows that it's intended for medical purposes that can be adjusted to various positions. Below that, we have the classification. We also have in this a lot of very product specific standards and things that the FDA, special controls that the FDA wants you to go through. Those are important because they start to show you what your product roadmap is, what your regulatory roadmap is. It's one of the reasons that we tend in our practice to resist standalone one time regulatory roadmaps. Because if you're staring straight at what the FDA is saying about the device and you understand it, you have the most up-to-date information, and then you can dialogue about what your path will be.
So with that in hand, the next question becomes, what's an eligible predicate device? Now this can be a deep search and a hard one and one that's will take you down wrong trails and then back again. But looking through the establishment registration and device listing at FDA.gov, you can often find predicate devices or potential predicate devices that have a similar product code to the one that you're looking at. You can also run this in reverse. If you happen to know a device that it's a substantial competitor of yours, you can find out from the registration and listing database what their product code is. Then you can start to work this backwards and say, okay, what would it take for us to comply with that product code? With a substantially equivalent, or, or sorry, a predicate device in hand, you have to start to consider this question of substantial equivalence. Remember, substantial equivalence isn't identical equivalence. It doesn't mean that your product is exactly the same as this other product that's out there. We would hope that your product is better, that you're, that you're inventing and you're doing cool things for human health. So here's the FDA's definition of substantial equivalence. If in comparison to a predicate device, the device has the same intended use as the predicate and has the same technological characteristics as the predicate, then it's going to be substantially equivalent. Now, what if you're changing the technological characteristics? What if you're, if this doesn't work quite the same way, even though you're trying to do fundamentally the same thing? Well, that's what the or is there for. A device that has the same intended use as the predicate and different technological characteristics, but that doesn't raise different questions of safety and effectiveness. Are the kinds of questions about safety and effectiveness that your device raises qualitatively similar as the ones that the predicate device raises? That's fine. But if your device raises questions that couldn't have been raised about the predicate device, hold up a moment. You may not be eligible for a 510K. And certainly if you don't have the same intended use, you're not going to be eligible for a 510K. So what's the difference then? If your technological characteristics differ, if your technology is different, you're going to have to submit evidence to FDA that demonstrate that the device is as safe and effective as the legally marketed device. So if you go to the agency and you say, I've got the same intended use, I've got a technically identical product, it's going to be a much easier walk than when you say, I've got the same intended use, but technologically my product is different. Now FDA is open and free to ask, well, what's different about it? And do those questions need answers? Usually they do. And that's where testing, verification and validation testing, or even as we'll talk in coming weeks, post-submission testing often becomes required. And you need to be ready for it. You need to be aware of that. So there are different types of 510Ks, and we won't go deep into these. Normally, a 510K for a new company bringing a novel product to market is a traditional 510K. But there are also special and abbreviated 510Ks. A special 510K is really for a device when you're making changes to a device that you already own. If you're making changes, there are some efficiencies available to you. And in fact, it's much easier to show a substantial equivalence to a device that you already control and are only making minor modifications to. So there's a cool path for that. There's also an abbreviated 510K pathway. It's similar to the traditional pathway, but it relies heavily on FDA guidance documents, compliance with FDA's special controls, FDA's consensed standards, and there's even a new safety and performance-based pathway. The idea behind abbreviated is that for a particular type of product, if we can get down to a really consensed understanding of what it means for a device like this to be safe and effective, yeah, we'll cite a predicate, but we'll rely heavily on conformance to standards and guidances, and we'll kind of follow the recipe, as it were. Now, you've got to be in a product uh, category where you're not changing too much, where it really can fit into those standards and into those guidances. 
So that brings us to an abrupt end to our first, uh, our first week of how do I get a 510K? Well, the question this week is, is a 510K even right for you? We covered areas where companies may not be subject to 510K, either because they're subject to a higher regulation like PMA, or because they're exempt from 510K, or because they're not even a medical device. It's important to recognize which of those categories you fall into so that you can start to target and find, if it's a 510K, what your predicate device could be and what substantial equivalence elements are gonna come into that. What sorts of things are we gonna to have to start to compare? Is my intended use the same? Are my technological characteristics the same? And if they're not, oh boy, do they raise new questions of safety or efficacy? And if they don't, just to be prepared to walk that walk with FDA to prove it. That's the end of this presentation. Next week, we will be talking about what goes into a 510K specifically. We will pause uh, here for any questions that you may have. Feel free to raise a hand or um, uh, that'll work uh, well too. We have a little kudos there. Great session. Thank you, Ken, for that uh, comment. We would love to answer your questions live if you have them. Uh, feel free to take an example in your um, your work and uh, and obviously de uh, de identify it if you want to ask a specific question. Uh, but we would be happy to field those now. I'll give you just a minute to raise a hand or type it into the Q and A. And a reminder while we're waiting there uh, to be sure to go and be part of A2 Biosocial on Tuesday, the 9th uh, at York in Ann Arbor. Uh, they would love to see you, Matthew Himes, uh, bringing us all the way through the, uh, the pandemic and finally starting to take sponsors again and starting to get people together. We did have a hand off and on there. Let's see. Oops. We're, let's try this again here. Friend Ken Spencer with a question. Yes, Gene, as I said, a really great session. Looking forward to the next couple of weeks on this. Um, I guess my question is the difference that companies would have to go through with analytics or digital kind of decision support software that's being developed. The questions as to whether they're a 510K or not? Yes. And, yeah. you know, the last guidance that we saw from FDA was like on digital stuff was 2013. So, um, I mean, it's confusing enough in that guidance, but in particular, in the last thing you talked about where if companies already have a approval and then they want to make a change, of course, in software, they're always making a change. So, yes. you know, are you familiar with uh, any changes or things that we need to look out for? for companies that are doing kind of analytics? Analytics specific, I think you're right that FDA still lags in, in identifying how they're gonna treat it. But the base principles they stand very firm on, it's always a question of coming to terms as to whether we are implementing those effectively and we're all in agreement that we're implementing those effectively. But so for example, there is a 510K, do I need to submit a new 510K checklist for a company that already has one? And you can take that checklist and you can reduce it within your company to a, a decision matrix that's translated into your terms, right? It'll be questions like, are we changing the intended use of the device? Are we changing the labeling of the device? Are we changing some fundamental technological method of, of delivering this care? That'll have a specific meaning for your analytics companies. And if you can, for them, reduce that checklist down they can, to their file, write a justification as to why this change, this type of change, doesn't need a new 510K. And mm -hmm. any software company would want to be thinking in those terms of understanding from a regulatory perspective, oh, it's this kind of thing that triggers the FDA? Well then, if that happens, we will be having a company meeting about it. We will be considering how to deal with it from a regulatory perspective. But as long as we stay out of these kinds of changes, we're going to allow ourselves a different way to approve that inside of our company. So doing those swim lanes, directing that traffic uh, mm -hmm. based on an understanding of the FDA's flowchart, that would be a real important thing to have inside those companies in, in, until FDA issues more specific guidance. Okay, great. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you. We'll leave it open for just another minute, see if there's any other questions or community announcements. If there's anything happening in the community that you want folks to know about, things upcoming, uh, let us know because these videos get recorded. They'll be out there. People can uh, see them and go, oh, wait, yeah, I forgot about that. I should go. Um, it's really interesting as uh, trade shows are coming back online, uh, I found myself not being completely in tune with them, not thinking that they were a thing anymore, but they are. Uh, medical device and manufacturing trade show coming back online. Um, the um, MedTech Strategist Innovation trade show, uh, both of these happening next week, uh, one in San Francisco, one in Minneapolis. Uh, but these things are starting to come back online and your events may be coming back online, so feel free to raise a hand and announce them if there's anything coming up in the coming months. Not seeing any of those, we'll be back next week. I'm really excited for what is happening um, as we come uh, to the end of 2021 and where we're gonna be going in 2022. We have not announced those plans yet, but we've got some really cool stuff coming. I can't wait to get there. But for now, we're gonna finish out the month of November up to Thanksgiving, talking about 510Ks. How do I get a 510K next week? What goes into a 510K? What even goes into this crazy thing? Week after, we'll talk about how do we populate that. So I'm looking forward to talking with you next week. Thanks for being with us today on MedTech Crossroads. Bye-bye.